was the most divisive conflict in American history, and by far the bloodiest. More than 600,000 men died in the Civil War. And over 130 years later, their ghosts are said to linger on the very land where those battles are reenacted. For many, Civil War battlefields are sacred ground, bearing witness to the country's violent struggle. But for some, those grounds are not just hallowed, they are haunted. Haunted with the sounds, images, and emotions of a war that some believe has never ended. Hello, I'm Bill Curtis. On this program, the strange stories of people haunted by the ghosts of the Civil War. First in Gettysburg, a professional storyteller's tales take on a ghostly life of their own. Then a young woman claims she often sees phantom soldiers in an historic Mississippi home. Finally, at a battlefield in Tennessee, an historian encounters what he believes is the legendary spirit known as Old Green Eyes. These reports of Civil War ghosts raise questions about the abiding power of war and the human spirit that may always remain unexplained. Gettysburg, Pennsylvania site of the Civil War's most famous and most decisive battle. Battlefields surround the town. Homes are still riddled with bullet holes. And according to many locals, houses that sheltered the soldiers, like the Farnsworth Inn, remain haunted to this day for an instant, a fraction in time, you see into their eyes, their face, what actually was, and then it disappears. You may not see that face again, but the image stays with you forever. The Gettysburg that Victoria Howe knows today was quite different before the Civil War. Then Gettysburg was just another small town. But on July 1st, 1863, citizens fled their homes and hid in their basements as their lives were transformed by bloodshed. The Battle of Gettysburg was General Robert E. Lee's attempt to invade the North and end the war between the states. As Confederate troops overtook the town, sharpshooters moved into what is now called the Farnsworth House. For three days, the battle raged. Union troops would eventually prevail, but not before 51,000 soldiers were killed. The citizens of Gettysburg reemerged to find their streets and fields full of the dead and decaying. Today, the Farnsworth House is a bed and breakfast and a restaurant featuring nightly ghost theater performances in the cellar. Victoria was hired as a storyteller for the theater in July, 1997. As she learned about the history of Gettysburg, she also heard the rumors about the ghosts of the Farnsworth Inn. I had been told of a couple things that have happened, mainly in the upper part of the house, nothing in the basement. And I just waited to see for myself. And he turned his head and then... For months, Victoria worked without incident, but within one week in October, Victoria claims she experienced a series of incredible events that convinced her that the ghosts were real. The first incident occurred late one evening, after the audience had left. I was blowing out the candles in the front of the room when I heard a very deliberate banging on the pipes. I had not heard that sound before. I turned to look, and it stopped. 
I turned back towards the front. It started again. Again, the same banging, the same rhythm, the same volume. In order to leave the basement, Victoria had to pass by the banging pipe. As she finished closing up, she smelled the sweet aroma of pipe tobacco. Then she says a voice whispered, don't be afraid, Elizabeth. This frightened Victoria, as she knew that a young girl named Elizabeth had lived in the house during the Civil War. When things like this happen, you always search for some kind of a logical, reasonable explanation. At first, when I heard the banging, I thought, okay, I'm tired. But it continued to be more than just knowing your mind is playing tricks on you or for you to feel that you're tired. Two days later, Victoria was preparing for her show when she says she smelled something burning in front of the theater door. As she approached the area, she began to gag on the smell of burning flesh. When she opened the door, however, nothing was there. A few minutes later, the smell disappeared. I must stay awake. I must listen for the sounds of their footsteps. Several days later, Victoria believes she eventually found the source of the rancid smell. She was in the middle of her third show that evening when the room seemed to come to life with the images of Confederate soldiers. I'm telling the stories, I'm walking around the room and I turn my head and I see a soldier's head resting on the shoulders of this mannequin that we have down here. He's an older man, he's looking around the room I start backing up from the area when I notice a gentleman sitting in the audience, turning his head back and forth, looking towards the mannequin and then looking at me. I knew he could see him. Victoria moved to another part of the room where a dummy was lying in a casket. As she looked down into the coffin, she began to feel drained. Staring back at her was the face of a different soldier, this one with dark hair. He begins opening and closing his eyes. I could feel the energy being drained. Then the woman lets out a scream, breaks whatever had a hold on me. When Victoria finished the show, she says she was approached by the woman who had screamed. She said that while she was sitting there in front of the door, she smelled something horrible, and she felt like ice going through her. While she was describing this, I looked beyond her to that very spot and saw a young boy, about 17 years old, in a Confederate uniform. His body was crumbled on the ground right in front of the door. He was looking up at me, half of his face was missing, and the outline of this hole were flaps of charred skin. He started to reach out. I could hear him call, Mom. Ma, I'm Peter, I'm Peter, and then he disappeared. And I have not seen him since. Victoria claims that the soldiers visited her again, just a few months later. She was setting up props for her show and turned around, only to find the basement transformed. And everything was gone and there were three soldiers. The one that I saw in the casket was now standing at the bottom of the stairs. The two other soldiers, one whose head I had seen on the mannequin was now there, along with another soldier. They were moving large, heavy wooden boxes, and the one at the bottom of the stairs was directing them to take it up the stairs. Victoria says these experiences have provided her with a piercing first-hand knowledge of the suffering that once consumed Gettysburg. It's nothing like sitting there and reading in a book or looking at pictures. There's a space that you don't get attached to. You see it and you say, oh, that was terrible. 
But when you're there and you smell it and you actually are close to it, you're part of it for one instant, that's, that's the part that I think is like, I don't want to say frightening. It takes your breath away. At the Farnsworth House in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, a storyteller claims she has seen the ghosts of Civil War soldiers. She is not alone with her story. Records show that dozens of guests have reported similar experiences during their stays. People have heard like a juice harp filtering down from the attic into like the lower levels of the house, um, pacing, you know, on the floorboards above their heads, also coming from the attic. And it sounds like almost like uh, heavy objects like trunks or something being moved across the floorboards. The stories about the Farnsworth house were a natural draw for self-described ghost hunter Tori Clemens. Tori has been mesmerized by the Civil War since the age of 11, when he began reenacting battles. In 1992, his hobby took a paranormal twist. Tori began recording what he claims are the voices of Civil War ghosts. His method is simple. Tori goes with one or two friends to haunted sites and simply turns on the tape recorder as they talk. When the tapes are played back, Tori says he hears ghostly voices in the midst of the conversations. I mean, it could say anything. It could be battlefield commands. It could be just something pertaining to the conversation. Or it could just be anything, you know, that they're saying. A lot of times, it doesn't pertain to anything that you're talking about or doing. So, where's Dan now? Tori says that he has recorded up to a dozen ghost voices at the Farnsworth house since 1992. One such recording supposedly occurred while he was with Patty O'Day in the sitting room. At the time of the Gettysburg Battle, that room was an open porch used by Confederate sharpshooters. Patty was telling Tori the story of a woman who had tried to lure the sharpshooters outside during the battle. Tori believes that a ghost voice interrupted in response to their conversation. We pick up a male voice, it's a little distant, maybe in the next room, or maybe a few feet away, he's got a definite southern drawled accent, and he says, um, either you're going to question her or they were going to question her. This is the recording that Tori believes contains the ghostly voice. There was a woman outside the, the house that was trying to get him to come out. I don't know what her intentions were. But they were, they wanted to trust her, but they were. Here's the recording again. There was a woman outside the, the house that was trying to get him to come out. I don't know what her intentions were. But they were, they wanted to trust her, but they were afraid of her. They thought she... Tori believes the spirits are responding to images and conversations that seem familiar. It draws them out. When you're in period attire, when you're talking about what happened in their time period, when you're talking about the Civil War, even when you talk about the ghosts, when you're talking about them, they know you, that you're talking about them. Tory has recorded at the Gettysburg battlefields as well. He believes his recordings have sometimes captured the actual voices of soldiers still trapped in the war. For Tory, the voices paint a nightmarish picture of what the war must have been like. I mean, I don't think any of these guys are happy. I don't think any of these guys are like smiling or happy unless they're insane, you know, that they're out there killing people, seeing their buddies butchered, and knowing that their time could come at any moment. What are these storytellers and reenactors experiencing? Is it possible that a brutal death can be trapped in time? Can voices of the dead be recorded? Many believe such ideas are simply the result of overactive imaginations. Scientists say the recordings are easily discounted, particularly when they're made in an uncontrolled environment. It's very important to know how large a sample this comes from. You know, if you're recording hours and hours and hours of stuff, could this be a random electronic noise that you wouldn't ordinarily notice? 
people may have spoken words uh, in a group and forgotten that they did so. Or they may pick up extraneous noises from uh, outside. Or there may be ambient sounds that under certain conditions end up sounding like syllables that we can make into words. And it's also known that uh, tape recorders can pick up uh, radio broadcasts. Joe Nichol, who has investigated the Farnsworth house, argues that many storytellers and reenactors are highly dramatic and emotional. Those qualities make them good actors. However, those same characteristics may make them prone to believe their own fantasies. People do see apparitions and um, have perceptions of ghosts. Um, we, however, uh, who investigate such things have a saying that there are no haunted houses, only haunted people. And that means after long and careful study, and I've done this now for more than a quarter of a century, we find that there's a psychological component to ghost reports. People at the Farnsworth House are convinced that the soldiers of the Civil War are still there, reminding us of the horrors of war. Who knows if these guys know that they lost the war? I mean, maybe, they're, maybe they know that, and maybe they're thinking, man, I gave my life, I gave all of my tomorrows, and, and it didn't mean anything. Vicksburg, Mississippi. During the Civil War in May of 1863, this small town was the linchpin that held the Confederacy together. The fate of Vicksburg would determine who controlled the Mississippi River, and perhaps who would win the war. For 47 days, Union troops struggled to conquer Vicksburg. During those bloody battles, an historic home now known as McRaven served as a Confederate field hospital and staff officers camp. Trenches were dug in the grounds, and wounded soldiers filled the home and front porch. For many, the field hospital was as gruesome as any battle. The typical cure <laughs> was to amputate. And, the, and you were lucky if they, could, if they could cut it off, you had a chance. And a crack surgeon could perform around two amputations in a minute. They had one man cutting and another man sewing. McRaven's grounds were filled with graves by the time the Confederates finally surrendered. The home was all but destroyed. Today, McRaven is fully restored and open to the public, a reminder of those violent times. Over the years, people claimed to have seen the ghosts of McRaven's former owners, such as William Murray and his daughters. But recently, one tour guide says she has seen the ghosts of some different occupants, the ghosts of Civil War soldiers. Angel Thomas was just 16 when she began working as a tour guide at McRaven. She had been warned that the home was haunted. Angel was ambivalent about the stories until her first day on the job. According to Angel, the house was empty as she closed up with another tour guide. Another tour guide was teaching me how to go about locking up the house. And when we were locking the front door, it was already locked. And the tour guide said, I see you've already locked the door. And I said, no, I didn't lock the door. She goes, well, it's locked and I didn't lock it. We kind of looked at each other, shrugged our shoulders and locked up the rest of the house. About three weeks later, Angel was guiding a large group through the back of the house. They were standing in a hallway where Civil War artifacts are stored, when suddenly the overhead light turned off. Of course, my first thought was that the light bulb had gone out, and I said that out loud, and as soon as I said it, it came back on. And I said, well, I guess it didn't go out. And it kept going off and on at, I would say, five second intervals, and it did that until I left the room. And when I left the room, it stayed on. The electrical wiring is checked frequently to safeguard against fires. So Angel was now certain 
that the house was haunted. Indeed, many who have visited or worked at McRaven over the years have reported strange experiences. Hearing heavy footsteps on an empty balcony, a dresser shaking violently when all else is still. I really, in the beginning, never wanted to even discuss about this house being haunted because I didn't want to take away from its wonderful historical nature. But it happens so frequently in front of the tourists. We get other people coming back and saying, we heard tourists talking about seeing a ghost here. As Angel continued to work, the history of McRaven seemed to come alive, literally. One day, while closing up the house, Angel was confronted with the vision of a soldier from over 130 years ago. I was stepping off of the porch and I saw a Union soldier in a blue uniform. I could not see through him. Uh, he was a solid figure. I really could not see a face, though. And I looked at him, and for about five seconds, I saw him. And he, I actually saw him move. And he walked uh, to the side, sort of behind a tree, and he was gone. Angel says she first saw the Union soldier near the edge of the yard. But then Angel began to see him more often, gradually moving closer to the house. Eventually, she saw him peering in the front window. Often tourists will come to the window and look into the room before they knock on the door to come in. And when I looked up, I saw someone staying there, and I pretty much figured it was a tourist. But I saw the blue coat and the Union uniform looking into the room. Angel kept thinking about the ghostly image and wondered whether it was looking for something in the house. It wasn't long before she thought she had the answer. I remembered seeing the soldier with something that looked like a purse. Apparently it was a cartridge box, something for them to store their things in. It turned out that McRaven's owner had dug up the metal cover from a Union cartridge box just weeks before. Angel and the owner now decided that the Union ghost was searching for his missing piece of equipment. Angel says she has not only seen the ghost of a Union soldier, once she believes she saw a melancholy Confederate ghost as well. He was by the cistern sitting down on the bricks and his head was down. He did not appear to be aware of what was going on. He looked very dirty very hungry, very tired. He looked defeated, and I saw him for a few seconds, and he did fade and disappear. May, 1863. For 47 days, Union troops laid siege to Vicksburg, Mississippi, forcing the Confederates to surrender or starve. In the heart of Vicksburg, a house now known as McRaven sheltered the wounded and dying Confederate soldiers. Now, well over a century later, the ghosts of those soldiers are reported to haunt the home. Janice Reilly is a ghost hunter who has documented haunted Civil War sites for several decades. Janice believes that these so-called ghosts may be what she calls an historical imprint. According to this theory, at certain times, images from emotionally significant events like the Civil War appear in the present. There seems to be a thinner line between uh, the past and the present, uh, thinner than I thought. I mean, there seems to be quite a bit just beyond our everyday senses. And I think when you get into a historic place, that reality stretches just a bit. And the past and present sometimes merge. Janice does not believe these imprints are actually the souls of deceased individuals, but she does believe that these individuals and events have left behind some form of energy that could actually be documented in photographs. People leave behind energy, you can't destroy energy. You know, I mean, hundreds and hundreds of years of living in a place is gonna leave behind some kind of energy. And we just try to take photographs of it. Janice has taken photographs at McRaven several times. 
Sometimes the film reveals nothing. Other times, her pictures seem to capture a variety of unusual phenomena that Janice believes are energy forms, spheres or orbs that look like bubbles, vapors, or mist-like shapes that appear on perfectly clear evenings. Although none of the photographs have been submitted for scientific analysis, Janice believes that the strange forms are somehow connected to McRaven's bloody history. She even says they appear when they hear familiar songs or see activities from their past lives. One evening, Janice and her colleague Barbara Lloyd were taking pictures at the Confederate burial grounds behind McRaven. They claimed their photographs were not revealing anything until they began playing a familiar Confederate tune. And we started playing some tunes from that time period just to see, are they emotionally? Can we get them emotionally to come up? Because, uh, you know, we were getting nothing. We played, I suppose, about five minutes worth of Civil War music done on Civil War period instruments, and it sounded very much like it would then. And uh, within 30 seconds or so after Dixie was played, we had an enormous explosion of these things. Jettis and Barbara had seen nothing unusual with their naked eye. However, the photograph showed hundreds of peculiar orbs that seemed to have appeared when Dixie was played. Jenna says the phenomena also appear more frequently on historically significant dates, such as the anniversary of a battle. These photographs were taken in May 1998 during a reenactment of a battle at McRaven. Most of the shots are dark, showing nothing. But three of the shots seem to show misty shapes, including what Janice believes is the faint outline of a soldier. Now, we did do a blow up of the right corner, and when we did some contrast and lightened it up a little bit, it looks very much like a Confederate soldier. And you can see a knapsack, you can see the tip of a rifle, you can see a hat, and you can see him holding a flag. What happens to the tremendous amount of energy that is released during an event like war? Can the physical and emotional suffering of soldiers and innocent bystanders somehow linger in a place? Science teaches us that all energy, no matter how strong, eventually dissipates, and that there is no evidence that any kind of energy survives a person's death. It's no more likely that your ghost survives your death and haunts a house than it is that when you turn off a light, it goes to a mysterious uh, uh, paranormal light bulb area. Uh, no, the light simply ceases to exist. It stops, it ceases, it doesn't go somewhere else. Photographs that would seem to show ghostly energy can be explained by anything from weather conditions to lint on a camera lens. It depends on the camera, it depends on the type of conditions, uh, but when people say that they did not see the ghost, and when they are just odd little effects, and particularly if a flash has been used, the least likely explanation is that it's a ghost. And the most likely explanation is that it's some type of camera glitch of which there are hundreds. Even some who believe in ghosts say that many supposedly supernatural experiences can be explained by natural processes. William Roll began his paranormal research decades ago at the Parapsychology Laboratory of Duke University. Roll says that many supposed hauntings occur in areas where magnetic fields created by the Earth or man-made electrical currents are higher than average. He contends that the magnetic fields can stimulate the brain, causing people to see or hear so-called ghosts. There are surges in these magnetic fields that um, coincide with ghostly experiences. For instance, hearing footsteps or hearing human voices uh, 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 with drops in temperature uh, and things like that. 
So we are now beginning to see that there is a, a, a physical side to these psychological experiences. However, Roll contends that the idea of actually seeing into the past may not just be science fiction. He points to the physics theory of relativity, which describes the world in four dimensions, three dimensions of space and one dimension of time. Roll argues that this fourth dimension of time may linger in some unexplained way, allowing us to actually see images from the past. When you look up in the night sky, what you see is not the stars as they are presently, but as they were thousands and thousands of years ago. And in a similar way, it, it seems that we may be able to look back on our own history, get a picture of things in the past. For Angel Thomas, that window into the past brought to life the suffering of Civil War soldiers, providing a type of justice for the dead. The soldier seemed like a person. He was an individual. He had a name, though what I don't know. He had a personality. It makes a kind of poetic or romantic logic to think that if we die a tragic or horrible death, that somehow that will impress itself. We can understand why. Obviously, we want to see justice done. So uh, a tragedy, we want to see it uh, reconciled, or we want to see some redemption. Along the border between Georgia and Tennessee lies the Chickamauga battlefield, site of one of the bloodiest contests of the Civil War. On these fields where thousands marched and died, the legendary ghost of old Green Eyes has also been seen, roaming in a variety of forms. So whatever this was had to be alive at one time, because it walked. Now, the mist that rise early in the morning, they drift. One moment you're looking at it, the next moment it's over here. This walk, just like you and I. The Battle of Chickamauga took place in September 1863, part of a grueling Union campaign to gain control of Chattanooga. The mountainous terrain made for difficult marching and a year-long drought meant water was scarce. Most soldiers fought the battle on a single quart of water until their tongues were swollen from dehydration. In just two days of fighting, 34,000 men died. For years, there's been a fable that two green glowing eyes roam Chickamauga. Some say they are the eyes of a horse or tiger. Others say they are the eyes of a Confederate soldier who was decapitated during battle. Still others say old Green Eyes was around long before the Civil War and was seen moving among the dead during a lull in the fighting. For Chickamauga's retired historian, Edward Tinney, old Green Eyes became far too real early one morning back in 1976 during an anniversary of the battle. It was around 4 or 5 a.m. Edward was walking alone down the deserted battlefield roads, checking on the reenactors who were camping on the grounds. And as I was walking down, the moon was still out. And you could see just the same as daylight. I noticed uh, someone coming toward me. I thought it might be one of the reenactors. But not knowing for certain, I moved over to the other side of the road. And the closer it came, the more apprehensive I got because it didn't look normal. It didn't look human. Edward could see that the figure was wearing an old-fashioned topcoat and had long, stringy hair. Soon, they were separated by only a few feet. It turned to me, I turned to it. When it turned to me, it began to smile. Now, I'm not going to say it had pointed teeth, but it had a grin on it that said, drop dead. Almost as soon as they had passed each other, a car came around the bend. Edward was walking backwards by then, keeping his eyes on the figure. 
As the headlights of the car illuminated the road, something bizarre happened. It never looked back at me. After it got parallel with me, it looked forward and just kept walking up the road. And when the lights hit it, it dissolved. It vanished. What happened to it? It didn't come back across the road on my side. I would have noticed it. It didn't go into the woods because the undergrowth of that area is pretty thick right there. So he, he couldn't have gone in there, and where'd he go? Edward Tenney has never seen the figure again. Though he is not sure what exactly he saw, he is convinced it was not of this world. The younger generation of park staff says old green eyes is just a story that inspires teenage pranks. But one administrator admits that odd things do happen on the battlefield. Buck Duggar first visited Chickamauga in the fall of 1978, just two years after Edward Tinney's experience. Again, it was near an anniversary of the battle. Buck's ROTC group was running training courses throughout the park. Buck was checking the course early one morning when he heard the sounds of horses, though there were no horses to be seen. You can hear the horses, you can hear the breathing, you could hear them riding by. And uh, what amazed us was, especially me, was it was not a, an easy ride like someone riding through a, a tranquil park. It was someone riding hell bent for leather. Buck assumed that there must be riding stables nearby and gave it no more thought. 20 years later, a new job with the National Park Service brought him back to Chickamauga. He was startled to discover that no such riding stables have ever existed. Buck questioned how he could have heard so many horses. His trepidation grew as he realized that he had heard the sounds in places where horses would have been used in the actual battle. When I was working close to where the trains area would be, the mixture of sounds included wagons and, and livery and, and, and other things, you know, a lot of clanking sounds. We were along the battle line. It sounded like the hoofbeats were a lot faster, a lot harder. Another strange experience increased Buck's uneasiness. It happened while he was helping install a new phone system in his office building, which is located on the battlefield. That evening, he was alone after hours. As I sat there working, the superintendent's telephone speaker came on with a dial tone just blaring in his office. So I got up and went in and uh, turned the phone off. As I turned to come back in my office, out his door into the secretary's office, her phone speaker came on also. So I walked over and through his office and turn hers off, too. As Buck turned to leave the secretary's office, the purchasing agent's phone in the next room began buzzing. When he turned that one off, the phone at the neighboring desk lit up. By then, the chain of phones had led Buck in a circle, leading back to his office. For a moment, all was quiet. Then the speakerphone in his office lit up. As he walked in to turn his phone off, he suddenly felt very strange. I was thinking it was going to be very difficult to reconcile this with what I know is fact, that there are no ghosts. And I don't believe in ghosts. According to Buck, the phone lines are not connected in a way that would allow them to come on in a circular pattern. Still, he tries hard to convince himself that there is a logical explanation for what happened. And I'm sure that it was a milliamp drop in the telephone system that caused those to occur. I'm sure that's what it is. I'm sure that's what it is. Because I still have to work here at night. So that's the only thing it can be, because I don't believe in ghosts. 
Is there something unique about the Civil War that has branded these battlegrounds? Can the deaths of soldiers leave a residual presence? There is no literal way that an event, no matter how tragic, stamps itself upon a place independent of people knowing about it. There's nowhere you can go on this planet but that there hasn't been some sort of tragedy, some sort of attack, some sort of pain. Now, why should we not why should the world not be, be full of these haunting experiences, apparitions, ghosts, footsteps? Critics argue that stories such as Old Green Eyes show the power of suggestion. Once a haunting is rumored, people begin to look for experiences, eventually fulfilling their own expectations. A sense of tragedy permeates many Civil War sites. The landscape, houses, and memorials are all reminders of the carnage that divided the nation. To many, these hauntings reflect the tremendous impact the war had on our society and our grief at what occurred. Today, there is still continuing interest in the American Civil War, but not only because of family participation, many people um, can trace just a couple of generations back to the era of the Civil War, but also it was a war between Americans. It was a war between the North and the South. I know how all of that is part of our national psyche. It is important to us, and those deaths mattered. But they are not, no matter how much we wish it were so, they are not proof of any survival of the spirit. They are much more a comment on us, our needs, our emotions, our respect for the dead, than they are in any way evidence that we live on after we die. Individuals who are immersed in Civil War settings, such as historians and reenactors, may simply be identifying with and reacting to the horrors of the war. The whole ambience invites this type of experience, especially if, if you are creative, if you are a fantasy-prone individual. The, the ambience and the emotion and identifying with this drama in the past in, invites this type of experience. If you want to have the, uh, the hair on the back of your neck raised, or if you want to, uh, to have uh, the, the sense or feeling of having been there, um, there are plenty of stories, plenty of soldier accounts that are real. Even for the skeptical, though, the line between past and present is sometimes difficult to distinguish. And for many, it's hard to believe that the soldiers who lost their lives in such a dramatic conflict are fully at peace. The love that a person has for his wife, his children, his family is an extraordinarily strong bond. And to leave this earth in such a traumatic fashion and never get to say goodbye um, is a very difficult way to end a life. Civil War General Joshua Chamberlain led the 20th Maine Infantry at Gettysburg. Today, Chamberlain's words about that battle seem almost prophetic. He wrote, in great deeds, something abides. On great fields, something stays. Forms change and pass. Bodies disappear, but spirits linger. 